But I say unto you, love thyself, and smite thine enemies. Be really anxious about tomorrow. It's going to be bad. Ask, and it will be withheld from you. Knock, and I'll probably pretend I'm not home. Please silence your cell phones and take out your Bibles as we welcome youth pastor Brian Burns to begin our series, Things Jesus Didn't Say. <laughs> oh man, I'm blessed. I am so blessed this morning. Thank you guys so much. If you don't know me, I'm youth pastor Brian Burns. I head up the youth and young adults ministries here at the church. Thank you, youth. I love you guys. <laughs> they get to hear me every week, and uh, now you get to. If you're wondering why there's so much room up on the stage today, it's because the youth pastor was coming to teach, and he likes room for activities. So we're going to have some fun. All right? We move around a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So when I was uh, experiencing some, some uh, wanting to like dive deep in the faith, right? I, I wanted to dive deep, and I wanted to be able to defend my faith, and I wanted to be able to give the youth the tools to do so. I started watching some debates between atheists and apologists, and I started diving into it, and I found that a lot of the atheists um, were born into a Christian home or were raised in a, in a, in a church but fell away from the faith because of a lack of like answered prayer. There was like, well, I experienced this hardship, or my mom got sick, or, or my car broke down, or my girlfriend dumped me, and God doesn't answer prayer, so I'm getting out of here. And uh, I, I just thought that was, that was unique. Like, wh why is it that they were running away from their faith? Maybe some of you here know of somebody who tried the Jesus thing, and it didn't work for them right? Like, I tried it, and, you know, something went wrong, and they said it wasn't for them. Life turned into a bad country song, right? <laughs> it's like, my car broke down, my girlfriend dumped me, I got pulled over, you know, God, where are you? <laughs> for fun, we're going to talk today about some things Jesus didn't say, because what he did say is so amazing, so world-changing, that sometimes it's a, youthful, a useful practice to focus on some things he did not say to bring us back to what he did say. So for fun, some things Jesus did not say. He did not say, whoever does the will of my Father will always get the best parking spots. <laughs> if you lose your life for my sake, you always look great in your swimsuit. <laughs> but seek ye first the kingdom of God and you'll never get a zit before prom. That's for the youth. Follow me and your life will be easy. It says the opposite in Luke 9, 23. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Jesus didn't say God just wants us to be happy. He wants us to have joy. God will not give you more than you can handle. Jesus didn't say that. It's in the Bible in 1 Corinthians 10.13, but it says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. I believe that sometimes God lets us experience stuff that's tough so that we can learn to lean on him. Amen? Amen. Jesus never promised that you'd be healthy, wealthy, thin, that you wouldn't lose your hair. I'm experiencing a little bit of that. <laughs> you wouldn't get a zip before prom, that you'd be loved by all. He never promises these things. But he did say in John 16, as some of his last words to the apostles before he sends them out on his mission, John 16, 20, truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. Jesus uses the word, the, or the phrase, the world, 19 times in his upcoming speech and prayer to the disciples. He talks about, peace I give you, but not as the world gives you. That I came from the Father to the world, and I'm leaving the world to go back to the Father. If the world hates you, it hated me first. If you belong to the world, the world will love you as its own. But you do not belong to the world. That's why it hates you. 
Don't take them out of the world, but protect them. Be in the world, but not of the world. John 16, 20 and 21, again it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into this world. I don't know how many of you know me, but we recently were blessed with a boy, and I have a girl as well. And, um, you know, when, when, when you see your wife and she's pregnant, there's a lot of pain there. There's a lot of discomfort. There's a lot of anguish. She's going through a lot. Especially my wife, she, she had a, a thing where she was carrying a lot of extra water, and she also had this thing where our son was kind of a monster, and he's huge. So, <laughs> so it was a lot of extra pressure, a lot of extra discomfort, right? But then the second that baby comes into this world and they put him on her chest, it's no longer remembered. Even soon after that, she's like, maybe we could have another. I don't know. You know, I'm like, I watched you for nine months struggle. I don't know. I don't know that we need to do it again. Adoption's a thing, right? (laughs) But the second you're through that struggle and through that sorrow, that joy comes. That joy can't be taken from you. In John 16, 22, again, so also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. Hear that again. No one will take your joy from you. Right. Write this down. Write, <laughs> note takers are history makers. Takers. That's right. <laughs> Our youth know that. And write this down. The world cannot steal your joy. It cannot steal your joy. You can give away your joy, but the world cannot steal it. When your joy is cemented in God, when it is cemented in Holy Spirit and the salvation from Christ Jesus, the world cannot steal your joy. Amen, right? So Jesus explained why he is giving them this message in John 16, 33. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He didn't say, you got this. He didn't say, you're going to crush it. Own it. You go, girl. He didn't say that. He says, take heart, for I have overcome the world. And in this world you will have trouble. Pain is a promise. Struggle is certain. Disorientation is not only inevitable, but it's necessary. Suffering in this world is inevitable. Welcome to Westridge. (laughs) (laughs) But take heart. We have Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit. And I couldn't imagine going through these things without him. God did not say he's going to take our pain away from us. He said he'd take our sins away from us. Amen. Some of you are in the middle of a difficult season. I know probably a lot of us, right? It's been a tough year and a half. Maybe you feel left out, overlooked, rejected, all alone. Maybe you've lost your confidence. Maybe you're battling depression. You're struggling with anxiety. Maybe you've got some bad news or financial struggle, health challenge, or your relationship that's fallen apart. The pressure may feel unbearable. It's more than you can humanly do on your own. You're afraid, hurting, overwhelmed. You feel like no one understands. You feel like, God, where are you? Where are you, God? Don't turn your face from me in my time of distress, God. Hashtag chosen quotes. I love the chosen. (laughs) But trouble, trials, and hardship prove your faith. It reveals a deep faith that when you're going through something hard, the first place you look is to Jesus. The first place you look is to God, your Father. And the first place you look is to Holy Spirit, who's here to comfort you. Right? Right? 
So Peter's epistle, 1 Peter, was written to an extremely persecuted church. Her Jesus followers from around 60 to 65 AD under Emperor Nero. And then when I say extreme persecution, I mean extreme persecution. Stuff I can't even fathom. I can't even get my head around. He would skin animals and then coat Christians in those animal skins and send the dogs after them. And if that wasn't enough, he would coat them in wax, tie them to trees, and burn them for, while he had parties. That's some extreme tribulation. And it's in that context that Peter writes 1 Peter 1, 6, and 7. In this you rejoice, now, for, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor and revelation of Christ Jesus. The tested genuineness of your faith, that no matter what it goes through, it's the rock on which you stand. I worry sometimes that there's a lot of people in this world who identify as Christians or have a, a counterfeit Christianity instead of a genuine faith in Christianity. Growing up in the church, I've seen that. You know, people are like, well, my parents are Christians, so I identify as Christians. Or, well, I'm not Buddhist, I'm not Muslim, so I identify as a Christian. I pray and I believe in God, but I'm not really a Jesus follower because I'm not following him. As soon as trouble comes, they bail. Consumed by worry, Jesus told about some people like this in a parable he said about the sower who sows a seed. So one seed fell to the ground in thorny surroundings. It's choked out by worries and cares of this world. And there was another that had shallow roots. And trouble and persecution came its way and it quickly fell away. It's like, God, I have migraines. You don't love me. I'm rejected from grad school. You're not real. My loved one dies of cancer. I can't trust Jesus. My, uh, my grandma showed a, a real authentic faith. And uh, at her funeral, what everybody remembered her by was, God is good. Amen. Amen, right? Everybody remembered my grandma saying, God is good all the time. And uh, you would say, maybe you'd say, you know, well, maybe your grandma had an easy life. But when she was a young mom and she had a son who was a teenager, he passed away. And so she had to bury a son. And then later on in life, when I was very young, her husband passed away, and she had to bury her husband. And then again, later on, when I was a teenager, I watched my grandma bury her daughter after struggling with MS. That's two children and a husband that I watched my grandma bury, and she's known by a saying, God is good all the time. And that's how everybody remembers her. Now, that's an authentic, genuine faith that cannot be shaken, that cannot be moved. And that's what I want to strive for. One of my favorite verses is uh, Romans 5, 1 through 5. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's Love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Amen. Though we suffer, we'll persevere. Through our perseverance, we'll build character. And through our character, we'll have a hope that is eternal and rooted in Jesus. Given to us by the Holy Spirit. 
I have a fun story I like to tell. All the youth have heard this before. My family's heard this before. But when I was young and I was playing hockey, and I was traveling around the boards, and I went to go get the puck, and I was, I was flying into the corner, and my stick got caught, and it jammed into my gut. I mean, real hard, right in the jejunum. And uh, I doubled over, and I'm like, oh, man. And I barely make it to the bench. And I'm, I mean, I'm just leaned over in pain. My dad comes up to me, and he says, hey, it only hurts till the pain's gone. <laughs> Which is a ridiculous saying. But I lived my life by this saying. I love this saying. It only hurts till the pain's gone. It's not forever. It may last a long time. It may be 40 years in the desert, but it's not forever. It may last a while, but it's not eternity. We have an eternity where there will be no pain. We could take it a step further in James 1, 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. When you don't see the point, when you're discouraged, when you're overwhelmed, when you're afraid, could it be that God's preparation comes packaged as pain? That God's not sending the pain, but he ain't wasting it. Right? I guarantee you, if you're going through something, God's got a plan for it. He does not waste pain. Your trials won't weaken your faith. They'll make you stronger. Tell yourself, it's not pain, it's preparation. You weren't turned down, you were toughened up. You know, I know this. When, when I was at my last job and I, and I applied for a promotion and I was working with the youth and, and I was working an evening shift, and so it, it never worked out, and it was, it was a real struggle, right? And I'm like, God, this has got to be your plan. Like, I know your plan for me is, is to help and volunteer in this area. Like, why can't I get this promotion that would get me to daylight? And I got rejected, and I got turned down. Like, seven times I applied for promotions that I got turned down for. But that rejection and that, and that not failure, but that pushed aside or, or neglection, neglected shin. It built me up. It made me stronger, right? Like, I, I learned to press in, to lean on God, to be like, God, I know you got a plan, and I know you're going to pull me through this, that you're going to get me where you need me and where you want me to be and where I need to be. You're doing it for me. Compliments and praise didn't prepare me. Rejection did. The offense is purifying your heart. The loneliness is teaching you to trust God like never before. The betrayal is expanding your capacity to love and forgive. Is it a setback? Or is it God setting you up to show up and show off? God wanting to show up and show off in your life. You're wrecked with pain. I promise you there's a purpose to that pain. God never wastes the hurt. Maybe you're saying, like, you don't know what I'm going through. It's easy for you to say. Jesus contrasts it with two things, right? He says, in the world and in me, or in Christ. In the world, you will have trouble. In the world, you may struggle. In the world, you may have addictions. You may have divorce. In the world, you may have hurt and you may have pain. And in the world, you'll feel rejected, alone, anxious, depressed, In the world, you can have those. But in me, when you rest in me, you have peace. In me, you have joy. In me, you have life. 1 John 5, 4 through 5 says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? I don't know. I'm going to invite the band back up to uh, to play here in a little bit, and uh, we're going to dwell on on some of this, and we got another scripture and stuff, but um, think about that. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? 
Like we said in Romans 5, it says, those who are in Christ, though they suffer, will persevere. Who is it that has overcome the world except the one who believes that Jesus is Christ, that Jesus is the Son of God? Amen. Amen. John 16, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus has overcome heartache. He's overcome rejection. He's overcome hardship. He's overcome suffering. He's overcome the world. And if we're suffering, let's take that time to say, God, I give this to you. Bring me help, bring me restoration, bring me healing, bring me these things, but I'm leaning on you for that. And we sing in that song, you're too good to not believe. God, you've, we've seen all these amazing miracles. We've seen these things happen. God, I lean on you for those things. And whether it happens now or it happens later, I know that you are going to make a purpose for this pain, that you are going to be with me in it, that you're going to build me up through it, and that I'm going to grow closer to you in it. The good news is not that Jesus saves us from our pain. The good news is that Jesus saves us from our sins. It's not that he's come to save us from all the discomforts of the world. It's that he comes to save us from our sins and the result thereof. I want to pray today that everyone in here would know that they have that genuine faith. That if you're a little bit rocky, if you're not sure, if you don't know about this Jesus guy, if you're not sure if you want to take that step, I want to encourage you to take that step and lean on God. Lean on Christ, lean into the Holy Spirit. We want that genuine faith that cannot be rocked. I pray that, that someday when I have a funeral, hopefully long off, maybe never, who knows what, what happens, but <laughs> someday when that comes, I pray that I'm remembered as the person who said something like, God is good all the time. That my faith was sturdy, that my faith was a rock. That no matter what, I, never, I didn't stray from him. I know I struggled a lot when I was, when I was a little younger, a little bit younger, um, with guilt because I wasn't, wasn't perfect, that I failed, right? I was raised as a Christian. I believed in God. I had a relationship with Jesus, but I messed up. And I struggled with that guilt. God can't use me. I failed. And I'm reminded of Peter. Peter says, he denies Jesus three times. Once to a little girl. And Jesus reminds him of that event to let him know, I still love you and I'm still going to use you. And he ends up with the greatest altar call in history. When he speaks to Joseph about a dream of him leading a nation, he still has to go through rejection from his brothers, being sold into slavery, being falsely accused, being imprisoned before he can, he can come up to that point where God can use him to lead that nation. God had a, pain, a purpose for his pain. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you so much. I thank you for, uh, for your love on my life. I thank you for all that you, you give me all that you grant me with. I thank you that when I am struggling and when I am going through a hardship that you are right there in the trenches with me. I thank you that you are in my corner, that you are my advocate, that you are my mediator, that you are always there for me. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you fill my life with a joy that this world cannot take, that you fill my life with a peace that cannot be taken that is found in you. God, I pray that everyone here would know that more real. That even as I go, Lord, that you would just make that more known to me. That you would dig that in. I pray that we never forget all that you've done for us. The times where we were lonely, when we were scared, when we were worried, when the world had gotten to us, that you were in our corner and you were right there with us, that you did not turn your face from us, but you saw us in that moment. 
God, I pray that anyone here who wants to experience that would, would, would be given the boldness to come up front when it comes time and that they would pray with the prayer team. I pray that you would fill everyone here and we'd be refreshed with your word, not my words, Lord, your words that it would be a refreshing and a renewing, that we would look at this world ready to go. Ready to take on what it is we have to take on for you. And ready to grow stronger with you, even if we're suffering. Praise you, Lord. Give you all the glory and honor. It's in your name we pray. And again, if, if, if you want to see prayer, if you want prayer for something, the prayer teams will come up here in a little bit. I encourage you to do so, to take that step, to step out in faith, to come up and, and receive some prayer. I love you guys. Thank you for letting me come up here and yell at you for a little while. I really appreciate it. It's like my favorite pastime. And uh, I love you all. Thanks.